Hello, everyone, and welcome to another 8th Wall Live Learning Session. This is our live webinar series where we invite our developers to come join us for an interactive session of tips and tricks related to 8th Wall Web AR development. If this is your first time here, during these sessions, we talk about what's new at 8th Wall. Then we dive into relevant demos or topics, in this case, real-time reflections and realism in Web AR. And finally, open things up for our live Q&A. If you have any questions, please enter them using the Zoom Q&A window. This session will be recorded and it will be posted on YouTube and emailed out to everyone who registered. Before we jump into today's content, some quick introductions. My name is Joel Ludwin and I'm a product manager at 8th Wall. And I'm joined today by Rigel Benton, who is our lead product designer. It's very likely that you already seen us or interacted with us through our developer Slack channel. If you aren't a member, please sign up at eighthwall.com slash Slack. There are over 3,000 members, and it's a great place to interact with the Eighth Wall developer community, ask questions, and share what you've created. Our goal is to pass along some tips and tricks we've learned along the way working with our developer community. We really value developer input, so if you have feedback, feature requests or issues, please reach out to us at any time. With that, let's jump in with a quick update on some new things from the team. Then I'll turn it over to Rigel for today's topic, which is real-time reflections and realism in WebAR. So just a brief update on what's new. Our last live learning was in early December. So in case you missed it, I wanted to share that as of De uh, December 14th, iOS 14.3 brought camera access to WK WebView, enabling your Web AR experiences to work in all major iOS apps, including Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, Messenger, and Chrome, increasing discovery and the ability to reach the 728 million iPhone users worldwide. With 8th Wall's own release, we've added support for WK WebView on devices running iOS 14.3 and higher and updated our open source library XR Extras with the necessary changes to our intelligent routing to deliver the right messages to users wherever they are, including users who are running iOS 14.3 and above and accessing apps that make use of WK Web Views. So that's just a really exciting uh, opportunity to reach out and increase the virality of your experiences across all iOS apps. I'm now going to turn it over to Rigel to dive into our topic for today, real-time reflections and realism in WebAR. Take it away, Rigel. Thanks, Joel. Um, hi, everybody. So I'm uh, Rigel, lead product designer here at 8th Wall. And um, if, uh, uh, if you're not aware, we recently announced um, the ability to um, allow reflections um, of the real world to sort of, um, you know, uh, add those as an environment map to your objects in your eighth wall scenes. And so I'm going to share my screen real quick and kind of give you a preview of that. If you haven't seen this video um, that's been making the rounds online. Um, cool. So I'll kind of talk over this. Um, <clears throat> so there's actually a lot that goes into a um, there's a lot that goes into making, um, you know, your web AR or AR projects uh, look realistic. Um, and, you know, there's entire fields dedicated to this exact thing. And um, when you're working on a video game, there are roles um, dedicated to a lot of this work. But um, turns out there's actually a few pretty easy things you can do to make these objects look very realistic, um, sort of beyond even the real time reflections component that I'm going to walk you through. Um, and so this video sort of showcases um, all of these techniques being used simultaneously. Um, the star of the show, of course, being the real-time reflections. So, um, you know, you can see, uh, you can use them on all kinds of different models in different environments, um, and it really makes those models pop and, um, and uh, allows, you know, very subtle and very, you know, sort of in your face, um, you know, uh, interactions to take place visually. So I'm going to go ahead and show you. So um, on our eighth wall blog, which recently launched, um, if you go here um, at the top, you can read all about um, why one would want to use realistic reflections uh, in this blog post, which is really great read. 
um, sort of describing, you know, um, you know, from a um, from a business perspective, um, retention and all the all the reasons why you'd want uh, and, and ways to convince you know your brand clients to uh, to really lean into this technology. Um, and then separately, we have a blog post that was written to kind of explain a lot of what I'm going to go over today, which is the um, the the technical implementation of ways to improve and optimize your 3D um, models for web AR projects. And so um, so with that. Uh, I, I actually found a tweet just before we started um, from uh, from a developer. I thought I wanted to share real quick uh, where they've done this. Um, they've added the real-time reflections to a disco ball, which is really fun to see. Uh, so, you know, in a moment, you'll see how easy this is to add it to your existing models that already have uh, PBR materials applied. And, uh, and I hope to see a lot more videos like this because it's a really creative outlet, I think. Um, and it was a lot of fun making the video because of this. So, um, so to start off, I've created a project um, that uh, that follow along here, and um, and here's what we start with, right? We've started with this, um, you know, sort of this the monkey robot monkey skull from the video, uh, but I, it's sitting in a scene with no lights, uh, no shadows. Um, you know, no um, cube maps, right? So this is sort of what you're, you know, what, what happens when you just import a model into a scene. And, um, and I should say, this is also using A-Frame. So for the duration of this, um, I'm using A-Frame. There are other frameworks out there where you can deploy these same techniques. So all of this is transferable knowledge. Um, but, uh, but I just wanted us to, to, for the sake of today, kind of go through the A-Frame version of this. So um, in our A-frame scene, you can see we've imported our model uh, and we've um, you know, added him to the scene. Uh, you know, we've got some really basic you know, sort of touch interactions here, pinch scale, finger rotate. Um, you know, I don't want to get into all of how all that works today, but just know that you know, adding these XR extras components um, will allow you to do that. And then, um, and then we have a ground plane that's allowing us to sort of raycast uh, against it. And that's how we're um, dragging it along the surface, uh, but you'll notice that there are no shadows. And so we we'll want to add all of these things. So, um, you know, when we're talking about, you know, optimizing for frame rate and what we can we, can we do with our models to make it more realistic, you know, frame rate is a really important part of that, right? If you have a very sluggish experience, it's not going to feel very real. And on the model side, there's a couple different things you can do um, to, to make that uh, much, much easier on your, um, on your scene to process. The first is uh, model geometry. And so you notice in the video, I had this, you know, sort of 3D scan um, of a car that appeared. Well, this car that you're actually seeing right here is um, 2.5 million faces, 2 million verts. It's running a, a single 8K texture, which brings it out to like 183 megabytes. It's massive. Um, and if I turn on the wireframe, you can see just how dense all this geometry is. Um, this is not great for, um, you know, for web AR uh, because it's just, it's so much. And it's not just that it's a lot, it's that it's unnecessarily dense, right? Like, you know, one of the first things that I would do when evaluating a model to be used in a scene like this is um, figuring out, you know, what I can do to decimate that geometry, to bring it way down, um, but, but, you know, still to the point where, um, you know, it's visually acceptable, right? So we talk about, you know, you always want to strive for the least dense model, but with the highest obs human observable realism, right? Like um, the highest quality that you can notice. And these phone screens are much smaller than some expansive desktop. So, um, so as an example there, right, I, uh, I went ahead and dropped it into Blender. I brought it from 183 megabytes down to 15 megabytes, um, which it could still probably use some help. But you'll notice the wireframe, um, it's much, much, much less dense. And if I turn this off, you can see that it's visually imperceptible. I mean, like the, the difference is you, you would have to zoom really close to be able to notice any difference. Um, but now uh, this went from an 8K texture to a 2K texture, and we went from 2 million verts to 200,000. So, um, you know, so you can make big strides in performance that, you know, the previous model wouldn't even load on that web page, right? Um, for a number of reasons, one of which being the texture size was too large. Um, you know, there's a, there's a concept in WebGL called WebGL max texture size. 
And um, it, there's actually a website you can go to on any phone or, or desktop browser called webglreport.com. Um, that will bring up, you know, whatever the max text, WebGL texture size that's available in that browser. Um, this Android um, Note 10 Plus, the max is 4K. So the previous model being having an 8K texture, um, it, you know, WebGL just wouldn't be able to run it. So, so keep that in mind. That also applies to things like video files um, or holograms. So if you're trying to import holograms or videos that you're gonna wrap around um, you know, a plane or something like that in your scene, keep in mind the, the max texture size there. And you know, like, I, like I had said, you know, the difference between this and the previous one, visually imperceptible, but you know, 8K to 2K. So um, you know, that's just a lot more memory for your device to handle that's completely unnecessary. Um, because you're just not going to be able to tell the difference and neither will your customers. So, um, so that's sort of a little bit about model optimization. And, um, you know, if we kind of go close this and kind of go into it back into our scene, um, I've already done, you know, for this uh, chair model that was shown in the video and um, in the robot skull. And uh, you'll notice too that this looks very different in this viewer than it did in the video. And that's not only because of the cube maps, um, you know, but also because the lighting's different too. So, um, so I'll show you, uh, you know, what we're going to do about the lights first, and then, um, <clears throat> and then we'll get into the reflections. So the first thing I want to do now that I have this scene set up is um, I want to add lights to my scene. So I'm going to uh, copy and paste in a couple of lights. So in a frame. Um, you can house lights in this A light primitive or um, an A entity, which is sort of like a div um, on a website. It can kind of house anything that you want to add to your scene. And then in there, we can add a light component and then define it this way. So if I hit save and build, um, you know, now that I've added an ambient light and a directional light that's pointing at our model, um, then uh, we'll see what that looks like. One of the things that's um, that's nice here too, I want to kind of briefly mention, it's more important for shadows rather than anything else, is um, this XR extras attach component. And what this will do um, is it will copy the position um, of the target. So in this case, model. So wherever model is, this A entity, this light will copy its position as it moves around. And you can define the, the offset here. And you'll see in a moment why that's important for shadows. But okay, so we've, we've added the lights to the scene. And now our, our guy's shiny, right? But you'll notice what's super weird is like his teeth and his eyes, which in the video were gold, appear black. The reason for that is because their metalness value in the PBR material, PBR means physically based rendering, right? So in PBR, this concept, you have roughness and metalness um, or metallic. And so, um, you know, in this case, um, there's actually a rough metal map being applied to our model. Um, which, let's see, I don't know if I have an image of that uh, nearby, but it's sort of like a big, you know, pink and yellow map, uh, UV map. And each one of those is determining from one to zero the uh, roughness and metalness. The rougher it is, the sort of, um, you know, more opaque it is, right? The, the le well, less rough it is, the smoother and more reflective. Um, metalness is all about getting that, that shine. So it, um, it's black because it doesn't have any sort of environment to reflect. It's highly reflective and there's nothing surrounding it, right? Um, because it's not aware of our, um, of our environment yet. And so that's sort of what we're going to do in a moment. And so, um, so but what I'm kind of trying to impress upon all of you is that like, you know, it's not just that, um, you know, a, a, a cube map, real time cube map will like add reflections, right? It's also adding, um, elements of light and color that um, the model itself sort of needs to look natural. Um, and so uh, even if we, in, in to, to begin with, I'm going to do a cubic, or sorry, a cube map static first to sort of show you what that looks like, get it looking a bit more normal. And then it's like the real time really punches it up. So we have this, the next thing that we want to do is add shadows. Um, actually getting ahead of myself. So one feature of eighth wall um, that's pretty cool that not a lot of people know about is lighting estimation. So, you know, if I cover up my camera, you can see like there's nothing really interacting with the lights here based on my environment. However, in my 
um, XR Lite JS, what this is doing is it's basically taking in um, from XR8, which is how you talk to our engine, um, our lighting uh, estimation um, you know, value. And then that's being sent across sort of every frame. And then on tick here, we're actually gonna change the intensity of whatever light that component is attached to, to respond to the ambient light of the space that we're, that we're in. And so that's actually pretty easy to implement. You just add this XR dash light to each of the lights that you want to control with ambient um, light estimation. I'm gonna save and build that. And then um, it's gonna reload for us. Cool, so it may not look too different at first, but now whenever I cover up the camera, I'm being kind of dramatic here. Uh, you can notice, you can see that like the, the lighting is actually changing um, in the scene based off the environment. So um, this is great for whenever you're like walking between uh, a darker area or a lighter area, people are walking by and you know, you wanna like sort of, you know, have things respond well to that light. Um, you know, you can change how dark it can get and how, um, how bright it can get you know, by changing the min and max. Um, so, you know, modifying these might change how dramatically you notice the swings in light estimation. Um, but it's just one small part of this much larger uh, tapestry we're building in realism. So, um, so now that we have our lights, the next thing that we wanna do is shadows. So for shadows, um, we need really three things, right? The first thing we need is to get our uh, directional light to cast a shadow. So um, here inside this light uh, component, I'm gonna go ahead and add this. So we've, we've told our light to, to cast shadow true, right? And then we define the shadow map resolution. So this is 2048 by 2048. This is going to um, create a shadow map, um, which is sort of like a, like a texture that it's making. That's then going to project through our model and then it's going to interact with the ground surface. So, um, so 2048 is pretty crisp. And, um, and because we have this XR extras attach running, um, it means that the, the light is going to always be positioned directly above or offset from our model um, so that it will always be, it will always look really crisp and, and the, the shadow quality will be very high, even though um, you know, uh, it's traversing maybe a long distance because the, the light's being carried with it. So, um, so now that we've added that to the light, the next thing that we're gonna need to do is allow the object itself to cast a shadow. So that's sort of, that's just done sort of doing shadow. With this model, I'm gonna say receive false. There's no, not really a reason for it to receive shadows right now. Um, and then lastly, um, we're going to um, add a shadow material to our ground plane. So right now, our ground plane is just a transparent um, object, but what we, what we want it to do is not just be transparent, but be transparent and receive shadows. So that's where we're gonna use this shadow shader. Um, and then this shadow component uh, allows A-frame to basically register that as something that should receive shadows from our light source that we created. So with that, I'm going to save and build um, and we should see, we can pull this up, see our logs. Um, okay, so now we have our object, we have our ground shadow. I can lift them up, you can see um, how that looks. Looking good, uh, doesn't matter where we put him, um, the shadows are still there. And they're slightly offset uh, because we created that offset here. Um, we wanted to position this directly above, I'd just say zero, 15, zero. Um, so, so the shadows are now here. Shadows are incredibly important um, for understanding depth, for understanding um, scale in your world, in your scene. Um, it, really, it creates a relationship between the object and the surface. You know, you notice probably prior to us adding shadows, um, it was kind of hard to tell how far away it was. If you're in a situation where um, an object uh, seems to be slipping and it looks like maybe tracking isn't working. Oftentimes that's because the object isn't positioned, the base of the object isn't positioned um, on the ground itself, but is actually clipping through the ground. Ground shadows are a great, a great way to notice that. 
because um, you know, you'll actually see the shadow cut through the model if that's the case. So you always wanna have ground shadows in your scene. There's never really a time you don't want it. Um, and they're critically important when you have things that hover or spend any time above the ground um, because then uh, now you have a way of, you know, sort of visually drawing that line for your user uh, to, straight to the ground. You know, great example of this is like in, in platforming games, um, uh, you know, they always have that shadow sort of positioned below the character, no matter what the character is doing, um, because it's really important in a game like that, that you know where you're going, right? And so um, adding that predictability and that, um, that, that relationship, that visual relationship is um, one of the most important things you can do um, to, to make your scene look more realistic. Um, so now we're gonna go ahead and add uh, a static cube map. And I wanna show you this before we get to the real time, um, because I wanna show you sort of what you had to do before, right? Uh, and, and this is still totally valid if you're trying to, um, if you're trying to make something you know, that reflects a scene that may not be in the world that your user is, uh, but you, know, you, you still wanna use it um, to give off a certain vibe. So what I've done here is I've of our images from this folder. Uh, you can kind of see here, each one of these images um, makes up a cube map. And a cube map is literally just um, sort of like a cube. <laughs> and, um, and then what we're doing is we're applying that cube map directly to the model as an environment map. And so the, there's like a virtual, um, it's like the model itself has some sort of virtual box that surrounds it that each side is gonna be one of those images. And then when you rotate it around and the way, uh, you know, it, visually it will reflect back each of those angles. And so, um, so now we have that in here in the QMAP static um, JS, you know, you can, we'll, you can see here kind of how this works, but um, it's kind of a lot, but basically all it's doing is it's overriding the material component that comes with the GLTF file after you've imported it. And it's then generating an environment map and then applying it. So it's a little bit of like, you know, taking what you've given it and then, you know, adding this new thing to it. Um, and this, a lot of this logic is just making sure that that works correctly. So, um, but the actual implementation is quite simple. We're just gonna go ahead and anywhere inside our A entity, just write cube map static um, and save and build. And you'll notice immediately the, this model is gonna look, um, it's gonna look a lot more realistic. So, um, most notably that gold is now, now visible. Why? Because it's reflecting back those images in that uh, sort of abstract studio-like room in, from the cube map. And so now when we rotate it around and we kind of go in here a little bit, you can pick out a lot more detail on the model and you can see even the, the different elements reflecting, out, uh, reflecting back from that cube map. Um, and that's awesome. And, and, you know, maybe a couple of weeks ago, this was sort of, um, all the, you know, you're like 99% of where you could get, right? I mean, with all of these techniques I've already shown you. Um, but then we were talking about QMAP real time. And QMAP real time is, is really exciting because not only do you not need to source these QMAP static images anymore, but, um, but the model itself is going to look a lot more realistic to the end user because the end user is going to have their own scene in that. So, uh, so now what I want to do is just um, swap out QMAP static for QMAP real time and hit go here. So I, I brought some props, the same ones from the video. <laughs> so we can, we can play with this for a second. You can see immediately now it's reflecting down like back this like red from, um, from this towel I have here. And that you can see even as I move my hand around how it's interacting with, um, with the disturbance in the in the camera feed here. And uh, you know, now I can add you know, this little cat toy. And uh, here's a, an orange. Um, you know, this beanie is really great for showing that off. So, um, and you'll notice as I rotate it around, you know, still reflecting it from every direction. You know, there, the, the really cool thing is the directionality of it is accurate, right? So it's, I'm on the right side of the screen and it's reflecting off the right side of my skull. 
So I move it around to the left side of the screen. It's reflecting the left side of the skull. So, um, so it's, you know, ideally this wouldn't, you know, I'm sort of, you know, trying to make it look really um, like obvious, but, uh, but the really beautiful thing about this is that it can actually be quite subtle. And so um, that's why I wanna show off the chair. So if I swap the skull from the, for the chair and I keep all of these like objects kind of similarly placed, um, you know, even if something isn't as metallic as that skull just was, um, you still really get that effect. So, you know, if I remove this and I, I have these like colored lights sort of moving in the background, so maybe I'm gonna turn that off. <laughs> um, but, you know, you can see even with this chair, um, it has very, very low metallic properties, if any, um, and it's still, you know, sort of reflecting those colors back as we move around um, the chair. So, you know, I think this can add a lot. And you also just saw how easy it was to just drop it in there and not even need to worry about sourcing anything. So not only is this, um, you know, add a lot to whatever you're doing, kind of regardless of the objective of the project, um, it's also, you know, quite, uh, quite simple to implement, but it works. Um, so, you know, for anyone uh, really curious, we have a project, if you go to our um, project library, um, you can go and check this out today. And, I, and that's why I wanna, not just this project I'm working on, but I wanna show you sort of what, what's going on, on at the public level, because you can click on this project, you can come in here, you can click this QMAP real-time JS, and this is the file that I'm looking at uh, in this project. So, um, so if you wanna pick it apart, you wanna improve it, you wanna change it in any way, like be my guest. Um, I, uh, you know, this is really just a start, I think, of different ways to improve this technique. But, um, but essentially what's going on here is we have uh, a cube map scene. So this is something where uh, in addition to the scene that we have running that you can see, we have another one running in the background that has uh, a cube camera set up. And around this cube camera is a sphere that sphere has been inverted and being projected onto the inside of it is um, our camera feed that is now a WebGL texture. So we've, we've, we've taken out of our camera pipeline from eighth wall, um, the raw camera image, and we are piping it through, making it a WebGL texture, and then projecting that on the inside of this like virtual inverted sphere. That then is taken and uh, turned into a cube map, similar to what we had with the static cube map, and that's then applied as an environment map on the object. So, um, so one of the big questions that I get a lot actually, since we've like sort of unveiled this is, is there any performance overhead? Like what do I lose in frame rate? You lose nothing. There's uh, cause you're already, you know, processing those camera textures. Um, you know, I, I haven't been able to find any difference in performance between the static or the real time um, cube map actually. So, uh, and, and you can modify this, right? So this 256, this is the, um, you know, for the WebGL cube render target, this is the like texture size. If you reduce this or boost it, it's going to change the, um, you know, the texture size of the cube map that's generated. So you can kind of tweak the quality a little bit there. Um, this min filter um, can change sort of, um, you know, how sharp the images when it's processed. So if you want to make it even more subtle, you can change this to some of the other um, min filter options. Uh, and then, uh, and then, yeah, you can, you know, even change the color uh, in the in the material that's piped into the virtual sphere. So you can modify, um, you know, the properties of the virtual sphere, which can can lead to some pretty interesting um, looks for your object. But um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think this is going to go a long way to helping people, you know, make their projects look a lot more realistic. And um, yeah, if you want, like I said, if you want to try this out, please uh, go to eighthwall.com, um, go to the project library, and uh, and you can go ahead and just clone this project that shows off all of the stuff I've been talking about. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rigel, for 
that uh, amazing walkthrough of how to really like all the elements involved in realistic web AR experiences. We went through shadows, lighting, we talked a little bit about materials and texture. Um, and then you really had an in-depth in explanation for how, um, how real-time reflections work and how that dynamic cube map is generated. So we're gonna head now into our open Q&A portion of our, our chat. And I already see um, some questions in here. Um, so just, I see a question from Ning Rigel. Uh, will this work? I think, uh, will real-time reflections work on uh, jewelry with diamonds? Um, yes, you can uh, import a 3D model. Uh, and if it can take a, uh, a, an environment map, this will just plug and play and begin working immediately. Awesome. And then I see another question from, uh, Piyush, talking about the video playback upon image target detection. So if I detect an image target and then show a video, can I add some reflections to it so that it looks more realistic and mimics as if the display is present with some glare of the surrounding? So can I put like some glare, some real-time reflection layer over my video playback to make that like a, a virtual screen almost look more realistic? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so yes, you can add this um, to, you know, all kinds of objects, including um, curved image targets, you know, any 3D object in a scene, really. Um, and uh, in, in um, you know, you can even do it for face effects. So I actually have a um, an example of that. If I just take over real quick, just to I admit to show this, but uh, so I go. I have this other tab open. So yes, you can use this with image targets, and you can use this. Uh, with face effects. So here's a kind of like a samurai mask I found on Sketchfab and you know, it can even use it here. So pretty interesting. And I think actually that image targets would be a great use case for this um, because, you know, imagine, you know, a, a wine bottle on a shelf, you know, sort of reflecting, um, you know, the, the different other bottles next to it, right? or the, you know, the ground behind your hand as you hold it, it'd be really cool. So, so just to like summarize a little bit, um, you can apply this to anything that you can apply a, a, like a cube map environment to today in you know, whatever renderer you're using. So, um, so it's completely possible to use this in all the ways that you would use like a static cube map today. Is that fair to, to say, Rigel? Yep, any, any kind of implementation that you've ever tried with QMAP static also works with QMAP all the time. Okay, awesome. There's a question from here. Uh, what are the best ways to generate cube maps? Uh, and can we render glass materials, for example, like a replica of a Gatorade bottle? Um, so uh, the first question, generating cube maps, that's what we're doing, right, with this component. Um, we're taking in either a selection of images uh, in the case of static, a selection of images that we have um, sourced ahead of time, or we're using the camera texture to create that, to slice it into six different sides um, and project that in the scene as an environment map. Um, and then for things like glass materials, you know, it's like um, uh, they can, ex like different, yes, if, you, if, you're, if, you're, if your material has a transparency property um, or you're applying some kind of like Fresnel shader or something um, to, to change the way that the light refracts inside of it. Um, as long as that shader can accept an environment map, this implement, implementation um, continues to work. So, um, so most sort of like, uh, you know, an A-frame 3JS, which is what this uses, right? The standard shader um, or, you know, sort of default material is PBR, so it can accept an environment map, so it can reflect the world around it. Um, yeah. Awesome, thanks. So, you know, just, just to, I know you mentioned this earlier, Rigel, when you were talking about, you know, frame rate and performance, um, because performance is such a, a, a key component of actually realism, right? If you're having real-time reflections and you have like a choppy experience, uh, the realism's out the window, right? It doesn't matter how amazing your model was and your materials and lighting and shadow if if it's um, if it's not performant in a realistic way. Um, so you mentioned that earlier. What would be like the number one tactic, the easiest thing that you can do 
uh, or top of mind thing that you can do uh, to enable realism while really thinking about performance? Um, yeah, I would say the, the, the biggest bottleneck that I've seen, or I shouldn't say the biggest, the most common bottleneck I've seen across all of these web AR projects is going to be uh, texture size with regards to models. So if you can reduce the size of the textures, um, you know, like it, to a point where, um, you know, it doesn't look blotchy when you look at the model, but it gets just to that point of, of realism um, at, a, at a reasonable distance from it. Um, as low as you can go with that is gonna make your frame rate um, just go, go sky high. Um, yeah. and, and you put a really great example I saw, Rigel, in like the technical walkthrough blog posts um, that you did on uh, real-time reflections and realism and web AR. And there you actually showed a 2K and 4K model. And, you know, just thinking that it's going to be on your phone, which is like a small screen device. And the, the difference in like human observable quality, it's, it's not really, it's not really a, a human observable difference, but the difference in performance is huge. And so it's really important to, to get it as the, the least dense your model can be with the highest human observable quality, right? It's not about the number or, you know, the computational, like what the machine sees. It's about what a human is going to experience at the end of the day. Totally. And, um, and we also know, you know, humans have all kinds of different phones and browsers and versions. Um, they may have a lot of tabs open. So it's always good whenever you're making um, this sort of content to, um, <clears throat> to, to test on a variety of different devices, um, you know, reaching back a number of years so that you have a good sense of, you know, what is your baseline? Uh, and then everything on top of that uh, is just really great to have, right? Um, yeah, great. So we have a question from Alessandro. How would I use real-time reflections, real-time cube maps in 3JS instead of A-Frame? So, um, so it's actually, you know, I, I had implemented it in 3JS prior to creating the A-Frame component. Because as you know, A-Frame is built on top of 3JS. So um, it's, uh, it's very straightforward. Um, if, if you hit me up on Slack or whatever, I can, I can send you over what I have. The, if you look at that A-Frame project that's up on the project library and you look at the component itself, it's, um, it's all of that is 3JS code. It's just wrapped in an A-Frame component. Awesome. Great, we have time for one more question if anyone has a question or Rigel, if you have like a final thought you wanna share. Um, I guess, you know, one thing that's kind of funny about this uh, cube map is that uh, it's not, it's only aware of what the camera sees, right? So if uh, it's not gonna be able to reflect back at you uh, like yourself, which would be like an actual real cube map would have some sort of you know, I mean, a real object, not a cube map, a real object would reflect the world that it can't see through the camera feed. So it's a bit of a visual trick. Um, so, you know, uh, we're not doing the impossible here. We're just adding what we know. And, uh, and that's important to think about too. It's a very effective trick. And everyone that I've shown this to, um, you know, is blown away by it. And they don't, and that's not sort of the first thing that comes to their mind is that they can't see uh, you know, their hand waving at from behind the, you know, the camera, only from in front of it. So, um, but I just thought that'd be an interesting observation to share. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. And just want to remind you, you can follow us on Twitter at The Eighth Wall. And to please, please, please join our developer Slack community. We're over 3,000 uh, members, eighthwall.com slash Slack. And Rigel, myself, Tony, and lots of other members of the Eighth Wall team uh, are always in there um, helping uh, with the conversation, as well as you know, the developer community helping each other, showing each other what they've built, uh, which is fantastic. Um, thank you, Rigel, for leading us through the session. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, this session will be shared on YouTube, and we'll also email it to all the registrants. Uh, so thanks so much for joining, and have a wonderful day. Great. Thanks, everybody.